here is natural instinct and here is control you are to combine the two in harmony if you have one to the extreme you will be very unscientific if you have another to the extreme you become all of a sudden a mechanical man The combination of all created itself over and over again in many forms original man animals plants and land earth air fire water gases the infinite elements that remain as time passes blackness from which I was born and where I rest blessed to be the sole controller over three billion years plus and more to go I hold the key which unlocks the mysteries of the ages. Pages upon pages of mental notes and I quote, Know thyself, for thyself is me. Absorption of truth takes place from my black hole properties as it now transmutates and begins to radiate, shining to reinforce the life which I create. Innate functions of the mind intertwined with space and time, spiraling. Living and dying consist of my ciphering, ongoing process that can't be stopped. The ending is the beginning, and the beginning is the end. West, east, south, north, Afura, the body of the life force. Buddhism Without Beliefs, Session 2, The Path. We have seen how the Buddha's awakening was his own authentic response to the questions of sickness, of aging and death that had prompted him to question what life was really all about and to embark on a quest that led him through a number of different spiritual practices until he reached the point where he simply realized he had to sit. The Buddha's awakening is the core moment in the history of Buddhism, the point at which the entire tradition then began to unfold. It has generated throughout Asia numerous different schools of thought and practice, and now we find ourselves in the West today once more trying to articulate and give sense and meaning to what this awakening means for us now. Let's first of all consider the word awakening itself. The Sanskrit term for this is bodhi. Although this is often translated as enlightenment, the word bodhi does not actually contain any suggestion of illumination or light. It draws upon an entirely different metaphor, that of waking up. Waking up is something that we all have experience of. It's what happens every morning when we awaken from sleep. I feel that the Buddha chose this term because it struck him as the most appropriate expression of what he had just undergone. The implication of this is that for most of us, for most of the time, we're not awake. From the Buddha's perspective after the awakening, he recognized his previous life to have been one akin to the state of sleep. Now again, sleep is not a singular state. When we are sleeping, sometimes we are in a deep unconsciousness in which simply nothing is being registered in awareness. But also, sleep entails dreaming. When the mind is very active, we are participating in a world, albeit a world that is created within our own minds. The state of sleep, as a metaphor for an unawakened life, suggests that for much of the time we are simply not conscious of the enormity and the richness and the mystery of life as it unfolds 
in every moment. And at the same time, when we do begin to activate our attention and our thoughts, very often it's akin to a dream. We spend a great deal of time fantasizing and literally daydreaming of recalling the past, of planning for the future, all of which may be perfectly necessary things to do, but they somehow cut us off from the living pulse of life as it unfolds from moment to moment. The Buddha's awakening is one in which he has gone beyond unconsciousness, he has gone beyond a kind of dreamy fantasizing, and has encountered the pulse of life as it is present to him in all of its depth and mystery. Although the Buddha, when he started to teach, articulated a wide range of doctrines, of philosophies, of forms of meditation and so on, all of these can really be effectively subsumed into the notion of a path. I think it's more useful to think of the Buddha as someone who opened a way to us, who introduced a way of life, we might say. In fact, at the very beginning of his very first discourse, the Buddha declares how he has discovered a middle way. This middle way becomes a motif that runs through the entire tradition. In the very first discourse that the Buddha gave, he started by introducing the idea of a middle way. This middle way he saw as a path that steered a course between the extremes of sensory indulgence on the one hand, in other words, a kind of unthinking involvement in whatever brings us pleasure, and on the other hand, an avoidance of what he called self-mortification. It's very often the case in religious traditions that in order to feel that one is doing something spiritual or religious or sacred, a degree of self-inflicted pain seems to be required. The Buddha, however, although he had engaged in such practices himself, recognized that in order for life to be lived fully, we need to be on guard against slipping into either of these forms of behavior. Subsequently, the idea of the middle way was developed in a more philosophical sense to describe a way of reflecting, of contemplating, that avoids extremes such as those of nihilism on the one hand, in which one feels there is simply nothing, there is no value to life, no meaning, and on the other hand, the extreme of what's called eternalism, the belief, which is common to many religious traditions, that at the heart of our experience there is something unchanging, eternal, which in some way is characteristic of what 